Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'll, I'll stand up just to make it more official. I might pull my trousers down a little bit, sorry. <laughs> I think that'll really get your attention if I just stand up and show you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, welcome. Um, in the words of Mrs. Sinatra, now the end is near. It's time to face the final curtain. <laughs> we could talk about our regrets, because we've all had a few, right? <laughs> Maybe a few too to mention. But anyway, that's, uh, uh, we, you may notice that, uh, that we, as, as I think I indicated in our last session, you know, logistics, we have to react to changes. Things happen. It's, things don't always go to plan. You can have the perfect plan, and then you know, something like a hurricane comes in, or whatever it is. But, uh, so some of our panelists who had previously agreed have had to step back. So um, what we have, we still have two you know, great, great panelists here, but we're um, plus two not so great ones with Louis and I. But uh, we, we're really hoping to, to make this less of a kind of, let's drill Globus and Subaru for 45 minutes to an hour with questions and really have a, a more of a group discussion. Um, you know, kind of fair warning, we're going to throw questions out to you uh, probably as much as we are to the panel uh, and looking to get, you know, your participation and involvement. Uh, that might be a bit of a big ask because I know you guys are, you know, a kind of quiet and shy group. So, um, <laughs> but um, no, I think, I think just a few kind of comments from my side. You know, it's been a great, I'm not going to sit down now that I've got your attention. Um, you know, it has been a great couple of days. Um, we, you know, it kept kind of getting said, it's a, it's a good time to be in vehicle logistics. You know, I think that was said by a number, number of speakers. Um, let's hope that that, that, that continues. Um, obviously, it's very positive, and we're, we're glad to be kind of part of that positive energy, whether uh, we're encouraging investment in capacity or looking for, for new solutions that make the industry better, looking more closely at Mexico. Um, but of course, you know, as, as I think we've uh, also mentioned, you know, any metric, uh, any kind of performance metric scorecard that we've, that someone has been kind enough to share, um, if it was a health check, probably the doctor would be prescribing some sort of pills to bring down the blood pressure, right? Because it's going like this. This is sort of, you know, potential stroke victim sort of, uh, sort of, kind of. So I mean, we, we can't deny that that, we're, that there are issues. Uh, across the network and, and things that, that challenges that we're facing. So, um, but the positive thing that I think overwhelmingly positive thing from my side, uh, perhaps a little bit in, in, in um, when you compare to last year or some of the, our other meetings, is I, I do think there's been a lot more positive, you know, willingness to work together, share information, um, as we heard yesterday, get, get past the, the anger stage, you know. Um, uh, you know, sometimes it could be down to a provider being a bit more honest and open about where they're, where they're struggling with their customer, you know, and, and maybe the customer can help, whether that's in a longer contract that they can take to the bank and, and get more financing or in scheduling issues or, or you know, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, and I, I, do, I, did, I do think that that message came out, you know, pretty clearly for me uh, and was quite encouraged by that. Um, Gary, Sal, uh, was it Gary from Amports who said that, you know, it's sometimes the tail wagging the dog here. Well, maybe if you're lucky, the tail. I think yeah. some people are a bit smaller than that. There's mm -hmm. in some ways a room full of fleas um, or stink bugs, maybe. I don't know that. <laughs> <laughs> we got to fumigate together. But, but I think we, you know, we need to influence sometimes uh, our customer. We need to influence sort of horizontally across organizations. Some of the issues don't come down just to, you know, the truck releases. It's because of safety holds or it's because of production planning, which is which has gone awry. And so it's not it's not down, unfortunately, just to the people in the room. But you need to kind of work together to educate other parts of your own company or, or, or other companies to understand, you know, how the supply chain works together. Um, so hopefully, you know, we kind of get on the way to doing that by having these sorts of meetings and coming together. Um, but I thought I'd just start us off with, with our panelists, um, and I, I'm sorry, I haven't introduced them because you have met them already uh, over the last two days, but of course, you know, we have Jerry, Jerry Lee from, from Subaru and, and uh, Glenn Cliff from Globus America. Um, if you both are, can maybe talk a little bit about what some of your key takeaways have been over, over the last two days since you both have participated. Okay. I, uh, <coughs> I, I thought the meeting was uh, definitely more positive than the 
than the discontent uh, <laughs> meeting the prior the prior year. Um, I was glad to glad to see um, the railroads show show up in in force on on stage and talk about issues. Um, the maritime thing was a little bit of a surprise to me. I didn't uh, I didn't know much about uh, either of those topics. Um, I think it is exciting to uh, to see the industry back to 16, maybe 17 million units again. Didn't you know it was it was a depression a few years ago. It wasn't a recession, and now we're in a, now we're in a situation where you know, it's it's exciting again that, that with the prospects. Um, the last session with with some of the issues arising in Mexico kind of surprised me. I hadn't I hadn't heard about the. Uh, um, the vandalism very much, or, or even the, uh, <coughs> the, the shipping issues out of Mexico. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when's a bargain not a bargain when you, when you can't move your product mm -hmm. and, and you can't move it efficiently and, and damage free. So, we don't have a plant in Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of, the, one of the few remaining. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, one of the things that I, I enjoyed about the meeting this, uh, this week was that uh, I do think that uh, everyone in here in the industry, at least at this meeting this time, was uh, pretty much uh, in agreement that the industry is strong and that uh, this volume that we have is not only going to continue where it is, but it's going to continue to grow. And uh, especially the railroads put in a, uh, um, a lot about uh, the investment they're making, and I think that's uh, needed uh, quite a bit. Uh, and I know that uh, the truckers that I talk to are doing the same, so uh, I know that's needed. And uh, also, I don't know what the attendance was at this meeting, but I was happy to see so many people come just because it shows that we're active in the industry and trying to improve it. You know, it's not that people have given up, and it's, you know, as you said, that some of the past ones I think were a little more heated, mm -hmm. which is, you know, I mean, it's, that's a good thing that's not as heated. So there's progress. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, think, uh, I think it's been a, a, a good event. So as we said earlier, it's not just about us grilling the audience uh, or grilling the, the panel members. So, but if you do have any, any questions uh, or any points that you want to raise, then please do at any stage, unless your name's Bill Garrett, in which case <laughs> we'll completely ignore you. <laughs> yeah, Bill Garrett with Vascor, and this is for you two gentlemen as well as the group, right? Benchmarking and standards, KPIs. Um, I, if you break the automotive industry into inbound service parts and outbound, I know the service parts, there's a very enthusiastic group that does a the benchmarking there, and I think there's something going on in the inbound, but I think that that might be a void on the outbound side in terms of benchmarking. I know a lot of times the OE spend time benchmarking against themselves, but I just want to get your perspective on how you look at the industry and how you benchmark against others and standards all the way along. Transit times, claims, damages, all of that. Well, I know in that our case, um, uh, quite often we get audited by the, the corporate office in Korea and they want to benchmark us against others and, and uh, they're disappointed to find that there is no central place to get information. And I know that se several of the, uh, the companies, ICL for one, has come to us several times and said, you know, if we were to put this together, would Globus be uh, willing to put the data in? to make it worthwhile, because obviously you need to have a lot of participation. And we've always been willing. We've always wanted to do it. Uh, we're not afraid to, I mean, I, the, the, the results of it would be, you know, you and, you know, other A, B, C, D, you're not gonna know who each other is, but you're gonna see out of the pack of participants where you rank. And we've always wanted to know. And I, I get questioned all the time by, by our customers and by our corporate office. How do you, do, you know, how are you compared to the rest of the U.S.? And a lot of it's just, we, we don't know for sure. We think we know, uh, but we, we, we don't know. So, um, and there's also a lot of questions, you know, it always comes up, you know, how much better service do you really get for higher rates? Do you get better service with higher rates, you know? And if we had some way of knowing, <laughs> it might be able to convince people to make that investment because we look at ourselves compared to some others that are, uh, have a reputation of paying high rates I don't see the difference in the service. So, um, you know, I, I'd, like to know, I'd like to see some data to back up those, those types of things. But uh, I think what's happening though is, you know, we're willing to share that data, but others aren't. So I think that's what keeps it, because you need to have 
a, a good group to, to, to compare to. If it's just us and two others, it, it may not be valuable, so. No, I'm not willing to share. <laughs> <laughs> that means he gets great service at low rates. <laughs> Our, our benchmarks are really in, internal, so we have we have plans that we um, that we establish for the motor pool inventory out at the factory is a you know four four production days or less. So that includes the car that just rolled off 90 seconds ago and the car that's you know waiting for a ride by rail or truck. And uh, you know we push the panic button when we get close to that, and uh, the processor kicks in a little over time to get us back down, but. You know, we have to be realistic when, in expectations of uh, how how to how to build a load for a trucker. Or we have rail cars uh, one day and we don't have them the next day. Um, I'm a little concerned about about benchmarking because I think maybe the owners would uh, would be able to ask us a thousand questions, and uh, we're too busy to answer a thousand questions about you know where we where we stand on a benchmark. That's a good point. Yeah, that, that would be a concern of mine. And also, there are some people getting good service just because they happen to have a factory or something in the right place, yeah. right? So if you're a backhaul and certain volumes make a big difference, I mean, there are many factors other than controllable factors that affect the service and rate. So it, it would be very difficult because once you get that data, then it opens up a ton of questions. Why is this, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, that would be a big issue. Well, there, there may be a plan or two in the United States that was, uh, where the location was selected without regard to logistics. Yeah. So that plan yeah. is probably going to lag. Right. And yeah. the logistics people had no input into, and they, they would have advised against it had they, had they known. But they were just presented with this wonderful opportunity. Um, and it's, it's tough in, in some locations. Well, luckily, that's only one or two maximum because uh, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> we all know that that's one of the prime, prime uh, driving factors of where to locate a plant. Um, can, I, can I throw yeah. that? Because I know that some companies, GM and VW, are trying to work with Carlisle, who do the, the after-sales benchmarking. So I don't know if, uh, you know, any other thoughts, whether it's through Carlisle, whether it's through anything else? Okay. Question in the middle? Comment? No, question in the middle. Hi, it's Mark Brazza with the FCA. Yeah, we're participating in Carlisle's finished vehicle uh, benchmarking study. Uh, there aren't a lot of us um, because I think Carlisle's had a hard time getting people to, uh, to get into it. But, I mean, I'm a big fan of benchmarking. I'll share data with anybody that's willing to share data with me. I don't think necessarily that outbound logistics is a competitive advantage for us or for anybody in North America at least. So um, I'm certainly willing to, to take a look at just about anything and you know, whatever questions come up from the data is just going to make me smarter. So, um, so we're a big fan. This is the second year. I'm, I'm just back, you know, a month now, but uh, apparently we did it last year. I saw the results from Carlisle, and I think like the inbound parts and materials study that they do every year that's, that's quite robust, it's going to take a couple of years to get, you know, where that needs to be because we don't have, um, you know, a history on the, on the outbound side doing it. But um, I think the more manufacturers that are willing to jump in and the more manufacturers that are, that are willing to participate in the process in designing what we're looking at and what, what we focus on uh, within that study, uh, the better it'll get year after year. So uh, I'm pretty, uh, pretty excited to see what the results will say this year and you know, willing to talk to anybody that wants to, uh, wants to participate. I'd be happy to, to talk about it in more depth. Mm -hmm. And the benefit must be there, I guess, because two of the guys who I know who, who are kind of, you know, supporting this or maybe even leading it, uh, Brian Burkhart from General Motors used to work in service parts and then under, so therefore understood the, the Carlisle model. And Jan Burez and Anu Gold from Volkswagen used to, uh, in fact, still include service parts in their, in their jobs. So they understand the Carlisle mo model. So the fact that they see the benefit of, you know, whatever it is, the, the thousand questions and the time involved and the benefit of sharing information I suppose tells us tells us something. But. Yeah, he brings up a good point because I, I feel like years ago, uh, more people felt like logistics was a competitive advantage. It's you know I got to get my cars there faster, and if I hurt the other guy, that's actually better, <laughs> right? So if I can screw up his logistics network somehow, I've succeeded. I, I don't see that as much nowadays. I I I, I think it's a good thing, um, but even when I came into uh, the organization that I'm in. 
uh, you know, Hyundai and Kia had separate logistics. And of course, both feel they're better than the other one, right? Because they're competitors. <laughs> and they didn't want to get together simply because they are giving away that advantage to the other guy. So I mean, and, and those are two companies that are, that are close. I, I just wonder how nowadays it would be if we took a poll among all the different OEMs, how many don't want to work with others and, you know. We've heard for two days about the new normal, and, and frankly, I mean, I've had a gap. I've had a five-year gap, but it doesn't look any new to me than it did <laughs> 10 years ago or 15 yeah. years ago or, frankly, 20 years ago, not to date myself. Um, I think where the new normal is or the new opportunity is is for specifically things like that, for OEMs to, you know, to get out of this mindset that, that, that this network that we share and this capacity that we all consume collectively create some sort of independent competitive advantage for us as an individual company as opposed to a competitive advantage for us as an industry, yeah. which then benefits everybody and helps the capacity issue, helps the throughput issue. So there's, to me, that's the new normal we should be aspiring to, not, not going through the chicken and egg between you know forecasted volumes every day versus rail cars that I'm not getting, which is pushing my forecasted volumes out of whack and right. all that stuff, right? So. Definitely an opportunity, and with the tools that the, you know, the technology that we've seen presented here just in the last two. I mean, it's different than it was five years ago. It's so much easier to share common timestamp event data without the, you know, without the ill definition of what I call a release versus what someone else calls a release versus constructive placement. Like, I mean, they, they truly are just timestamp events that we have to measure up in cost. And uh, I think there's a great opportunity moving forward to do more of that. Our, our parts department does participate in Carlisle benching, and they do pretty well. But I'm one of their customers at the ports, relying on them for timely delivery of accessories. And sometimes I'm not that impressed. <laughs> <laughs> but on collaboration, oh sorry, no, we'll take that question, go. Hi, Marty Kolbeck with AWC. Uh, Glenn, you made a great point about uh, the, the railroad saying that they were adding more equipment and more equipment becoming available. But a lot of times, equipment is not the, the problem. It's the, where the equipment's at. Uh, with all of the infusion of the Mexican transportation coming in, how long do you think before the model shakes out so that the equipment that's there is available equi equitably to the different manufacturers I mean that's the tough part isn't it I think it is um, you know and we keep talking it's either equipment or velocity right and it seems like there's always something in the way of velocity whether it be weather or uh, some labor dispute or something that's uh, causing it but um, you know I, I, I always question myself too like you know how far you know uh, in my in my presentation yesterday I originally had that I feel like we lag where we need to be by about a year <laughs> You know, it's like if we only had next year's capacity today, we probably wouldn't have this issue. But I don't even know if, I, there's no way to measure that, how far behind we are. It doesn't feel like we're that far because we're moving the cars. The cars move, it's just the pressure that my company gets is, you know, our customers want to move today, not when we get rail cars two days from now. And especially when it comes up to like a month end or something like that, or, or a holiday weekend where they're going to sell some. So, um, you know, that's the pressure we're getting. But, you know, we don't have cars piling up that we can't ship. They're, they are shipping. It's just not at the speed we want them to. But, um, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. It, it, I think one of the other things that, I, that I'd be concerned about is it, you know, a lot of people, it doesn't seem like their network coming out of Mexico is fixed yet. A lot of people are thinking about things like we are. We haven't started producing yet, so we, we, I don't feel like we have to have made that decision, right? But eventually we're going to make that decision what to do. And uh, I think right now our, our, our strategy is to try to keep all options open until some of the things shake out, until we see what others are doing and, and, uh, and see if some of these things are catching up with the, the current demand. So. Going back slightly to the previous discussion, um, we've heard at our conferences before some manufacturers talk about wanting to be a kind of customer of choice or preferred customer amongst and I mean Glenn you indicated some at least maybe not uh, some suspicions about whether or not higher rates or what the role that they play and stuff but would you would you kind of put that amongst the things that you, you strive to be to be a customer of choice you know I um, I, I think that and I, and I hope that 
those of you in the room that, that supply services to us would agree that I, I think we're pretty loyal. I, I, we are not a company that, I know there are some others that will go out every three years and bid everything out just because. And uh, in most of our contracts are evergreen. And I do that because if they're doing a good job and the rates are good for both of us, then you know, why, why try to fix something that's not broken? So um, I, I, I hope that gets us something. Mm -hmm. You know, just trying to, and I think just you know, switching around vendors, every time you do that, even if you switch to a better vendor, there's that time period where there's a little bit of chaos. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and when I have chaos, I'm probably creating chaos for the other guy too, right? So um, you know, I can always tell when something happens, I start asking, well, why is it backed up at this ramp? Oh, so-and-so switched carriers, or you, know, you find out somebody else did something that's now affecting us. Mm -hmm. So we, we try to prevent that you know, and only make changes when there's a need. You know. Mm. I don't know if, if you would. Um, same thing. I mean, we have, um, you know, it's cost, service levels, and, and quality in the form of damage uh, prevention. And um, we, we, we will make changes when we feel like we have to, but we'd prefer not to. And there, there is a, a startup cost of, uh, of making switches. And maybe that new vendors not as good as you thought they were. So I think we're fairly loyal. Mm -hmm. On the subject of collaboration as well, um, I kind of, you know, as a I don't know, advocate, you know, fan, supporter of automotive logistics as an industry, I do sometimes think if being the best provider, best, the best car maker at vehicle distribution, that you can do it at more efficiently, at a better cost, more timely, that your customers know exactly when it's going to get there. And when it gets there, it's going to be in good condition. Isn't that a competitive advantage? Isn't that something, or, or is it just, on the other hand, I speak to the dealers. Even recently, when I've been out here, I spoke to a couple of dealers. I said, you know, as dealers, when do you think, what do you think of vehicle distribution? How important is it to you? I said, we don't even care. Mm -hmm. They actually don't even think about the vehicle logistics. It's one of the things that happens. The car normally gets there. Sometimes it's a bit late. They don't necessarily know when it's going to get there. But isn't, can't automotive logistics or vehicle logistics or vehicle distribution be a competitive advantage or not? I think it depends. I, I, think, it, I think it depends upon the product. Mm -hmm. I mean, when people order a Ferrari, they're willing to wait 12 months to get delivery, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, it, but if you're buying a car because your car just got wrecked in an accident, they're going to go out and buy whatever car is on the lot that's available today. So, um, but with you know, the product that, that we're handling, I know that you know, most of our dealers have a supply to handle those types of issues. Um, of course, you want to make sure that if they're having a big sale or something, they have the cars available. But uh, yeah, and I'm not willing to say that there's no competitive advantage to it. Um, you know, I've got I've got customers in the room now, and I know that uh, you know they, they they would probably feel that there is a competitive advantage of being there a day earlier. But uh, you know, it, it it's debatable depending upon the product. Mm. I think. So if it isn't a competitive advantage, then how do we get the collaboration going? What needs to be done? It's it's been a subject you know that people have uh, you know I've I've brought it up now and again. It doesn't seem to happen, is it? We're aiming too big, an individual moves company, you know, from Ford or, or whatever it is, and then the collaboration stops. What's missing? If we kind of agree that collaboration uh, is really important, and that's where, you know, perhaps alongside technology, uh, where the next big improvements, the next kind of new normal might be, what will it take to really get the collaboration going? Because I think I said in a previous session, you know, the other side of the coin of collaboration is competition. You know, you'll collaborate as, long, as much as you want until there's <coughs> snow. And, you're, and then you're worried about capacity. And you're going to say to your bosses and say, hey, I know I've fallen behind on my deliveries, but we've got a great partnership with Chrysler. So it's OK. We've, we've spread out the load really nicely. I don't think the bosses will like it. But, so how do we get... Uh, collaboration going? What does it need? Is it, is, it, is it a real thing that can be done? Shall we just accept that it can't be done and never talk about it again? How, how do we get collaboration in vehicle distribution uh, in the automotive industry, in North America at least? And that's to anybody including the panel. Question at the front here from the young lady. 
Thank you for that, Louis. <laughs> I think uh, uh, there actually is a lot of collaboration that goes on, maybe small c collaboration as opposed to you know, the grand collaboration. There are a lot of challenges to it, but you know, I'll, I'll, I'll think of a, a, a couple examples on the fly right now. First of all, I uh, want to say thank you to Gerald. His, uh, his presentation earlier today where he talked about what he was doing to incent the dealers uh, to pay attention to extended hour deliveries, really big deal. Uh, one of the things that, that I focus on certainly, and I know my colleagues in, in, in the car hall side of things uh, focus on a lot, is what do we do to improve the experience of our professional car haulers, right? So we've got collaboration among our industry groups. We're, we're looking at the top four or five things that we can come to our OEM partners and, and, and try and standardize, pull waste out of the system. I think there are a lot of ways uh, that we do indeed collaborate. Uh, another example would be um, you know, looking at the remarketed side of things. We're spending a lot of time talking about OEMs, but I know there's, there's quite a lot of activity around pulling waste out of the auctions and uh, rental car operations so that the drivers can get in and out faster. And mm -hmm. getting that feedback from the car haulers is very helpful to that process. Mm -hmm. So there's opportunity. Sometimes it's you know a foot at a time, an inch at a time, a yard at a time. We're not throwing 30 yard passes, but, but it's happening. But is the responsibility on, on you and companies like you because you actually know what Chrysler are doing and GM are doing and Subaru are doing, so you can find more ideas and opportunities for collaboration, more so than the car makers who only really know their own operations. Is it the LSPs who should really lead the, the collaboration? Well, I, th I think we all have responsibility uh, mm -hmm. where we see opportunities for improvement. We have many of our OEMs that ask us, what are, what are others doing? What are the best practices of others that we mm -hmm. can that we can adopt. And, and so the onus is on us to bring, bring those ideas mm -hmm. uh, when we see them, certainly. Uh, but, but everybody has a role, whether, mm -hmm. it's, whether it's a processor, the rail, the mm -hmm. OEM, the, the trucking company, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. My impression is there's more co-loading on trucks today than there was five or 10 years ago. We absolutely co-load, no, no doubt about it. Our customers are, are, are very open to it. We look for, we look for ways to, to mix our loads where, where, uh, where it makes sense. Uh, we'll, we'll take new cars out, stop, pick, remarket it up, come, you know, come back over, grab POVs, uh, all yeah. kinds of opportunities You're like that. You're not co-loading ours, are you? No. <laughs> <laughs> where it's appropriate. Always where it's appropriate. You, you know, and, and, and as I think about it, if, if I were to go back maybe 10 years, I would definitely prefer to have full loads of Subarus on truck. <laughs> so may, maybe things have evolved. We'd like full loads too. One stop full loads, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gerald, obviously in your present, oh sorry, I'll, we'll do it from the audience. Yeah. Hi, it's Wayne Pollock from Car Delivery Network. Um, following on from the last comment um, and the last session, we had Rick um, um, from Toyota asking about can we have a collaborative platform where we can all go to one portal and see that information. Straight after that meeting, uh, working with Matt Cartwright from United, we have uh, agreed to move that forward and uh, that's an open invite for anyone else who wants to come along and be part of that. So collaboration is alive. So just, just for our guys as well, the, the lights are quite bright, so if you can make it pretty obvious that there's a question we can't necessarily see. Sure. Sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, no I wanted to um, go back to a little bit to your presentation earlier today, mm -hmm. Joe, because obviously a lot of what you were highlighting really is happening in the pipeline, you know, planning well in advance, scheduling, uh, obviously the allocation process. Um, I mean, is that sort of a factor of uh, the best of times, worst of times scenario you described where, you know, you have that, that high demand, low inventory, which is forced it? Is this, a, is this an advantage of the way Subaru is organized in that, you know, you kind of have more control and more influence on that? Perhaps then that might be something to also ask Glenn in terms of how you see that, because maybe it's structured differently. 
with Hyundai, Kia, and Glovis maybe picking up the chain at a later stage, for example, and how you might have to influence that differently. So maybe start with Gerald. Our, our basic plan is, is set for a calendar year and a fiscal year. So we have a 15-month uh, rollout plan that starts with uh, production and goes down to uh, uh, retail sales and dealer inventory. But <clears throat> the, uh, the, the, the tremendous growth that we've had is, has forced some changes on, on that too. And we try to, um, I, think, I think the model that we have now is much more predictable than where we were maybe five or 10 years ago. So right now it's more um, uh, fair share allocation in, instead of a turn and earn allocation among the zones. And then the dealers within the zones are competing on a turn and earn basis. Mm -hmm. So we have more predictability of what, if the factory has this much capacity out of, the, out of the 14 customers, who's going to get that capacity? We have a much better handle on that today. Um, and that can allow us to um, forecast the, the processing needs and the transportation needs. But you know, like everything else, there's people that are very happy with that system and people that are unhappy with the system. So it's, it's a constant, uh, constant questioning of uh, should, we, should we do something different? But right now, um, I think of the next, the, the next 18 months, I think we're in kind of a transition period where we're supply challenged. And then 2017, we'll, we'll take another step forward. So um, maybe things will change a little bit then, I don't know. Mm. But your ability to, to plan in the pipeline, right? Yeah, we um, we tend to get uh, you know an annual forecast uh, from our, our customers uh, that you know each year they'll update it for maybe a five year period. Mm. But it, it's pretty pretty rough data. I mean, just a couple of years ago they didn't have the Mexico factory on there, yeah. and here we have a Mexico factory. <laughs> so that makes a major change yeah, yeah. in what we were what we had planned. So um, yeah, the data is. Yeah, I mean, they've been pretty accurate, and, and, and there's sometimes I have questioned the growth that they planned, and it came through. So they've been pretty accurate with it, but uh, uh, it's just not detailed enough for really what we need to do with logistics. Right. So it's right. an overall volume. Where that volume's coming from or where it's going, it's very difficult for us to, mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. We've had a question through on the uh, Finnish Vehicle Logistics Live uh, from someone many of you know, probably Rich Frick uh, Senior, I should say. Uh, with the expressed commitment to loyalty, why is there a reluctance to long-term, real long-term, not you know, two or three years, long-term contracts, 10 years plus, which include yearly valuation and adjustments to maintain the level at the cost of, kind of, cost of living indexes? So when we talk long-term, isn't that you know, collaboration and moving the industry forward, isn't it? You know, a real partnership, a real long-term commitment to to the LSPs. Isn't there a value in that? He was saying ten year, ten years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we we have we have quite a few partners. We've been with that long, but yeah. um, I know earlier a lot of people mentioned three, five-year mm. contracts, and that's our initial contract tends to be in that range. But uh, then we go evergreen afterward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think part of the issue with putting like an index in there is you just don't know what the future holds, you know, whether the index will actually keep up with uh, what's going on in the industry. Um, but, I, in, in, you know, I was curious about it. People were mentioning they had three and five year contracts, but is there still a 30 day out clause or 60 day out clause? I mean, it's really a 30 day contract in my yeah. opinion, right? Yeah. Uh, so yeah. it, it, a lot of people were up here saying, oh yeah, I've got a five year contract. Okay, but, you know, is that a five year, you know, without cause? Yeah. Um, so, um, you, you know, and honestly, I, I think uh, to get those types of contracts, uh, we, would, we would need to, to feel like we're getting something in return, whether it's a better rate, some type of assurance of certain level of service, and we're really not getting the pressure for those contracts. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I I've never had anyone come back after a bid process and say, okay, those were our rates for a three-year contract. Now, if, you, you know, if you're willing to cut us a five-year contract, we'll take a penny off a mile or something. I've never had anybody try to cut a deal like that. So, I mean, it makes me wonder if there's any value to anybody because I've never had the pressure to 
make a longer contract. And in some cases, uh, you know, certain types of what certain industry doesn't want to go for a long-term contract because I think they they know that when that contract ends, the rates are only going one direction, <laughs> right? So yeah. um, they prefer not to have those longer term. Mm -hmm. so I don't know if you're getting any pressure for longer term. We we signed a longer term deal with the Port of Vancouver. The yeah, port well, property is a little different. Yeah, we'll we'll do longer term on property, but, yeah. but like a trucker or you know. Um, uh, I think five years is probably the longest we've been offered. Mm. No, the, the, when you have a contract that has a cost of living escalator you know, or a CPI or whatever it is, mm. um, I'm, I'm a little bit leery of, of just the, uh, the assumption that that's going to take care of the, the, the relationship between customer and vendor. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the, the, the shortage of drivers and as, as the current drivers retire, um, if you had a 10-year contract with a trucking company and you, you were locked into a CPI, um, I, my guess right now is that CPI may not be high enough to attract more drivers to the industry. Um, you know, if there's a clearing wage for every job, I think, um, as an industry, I think we're going to have to pay truck drivers a lot more five, five and ten years from now than the cost of living in, indicator would, would say. So to me, I'd be signing a contract where I know that the vendor would be coming back to me saying, this isn't working. And I would be going to the, to the, to the vendor and saying, you're not providing service. So if that's what I really think, why would I sign a ten-year contract right now? Can I just ask maybe Andrea or one of the Jack Cooper guys, um, would you want a 10-year contract? There's, there's a microphone somewhere. In the, well, probably in the middle, unless someone else wants to take it. Well, <laughs> well I can tell you, I would take CPI over nothing, so uh, that's an easy <laughs> one to, to sort out, right? So if you can agree that 2.7% a year ain't enough, which is the average inflation of the last 10 years in the US, well, we can have a conversation, but surely it's better than zero. I don't know, <laughs> Kathleen, do I'll, I'm going to pass it to you and put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty hard to argue with CPI being better than zero. <laughs> I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Okay. So, I, I don't think we'd be interested in a 10-year contract. It's, okay. it's, it's, it's too difficult mm. to, to understand what's going to happen out there. Mm -hmm. I think it's a long time. <clears throat> I think it's also different for a company like these, these two because mm. I think it's going to benefit a smaller guy more because he's going to take that to a bank, right? I mean, you guys are going out to a bank and they're begging for your business. Some small guy that needs that paper to, to somewhat back up a loan might be a little different, right? I'm not sure of that. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. just guessing. He, I think he has an answer for that one, other. <laughs> I don't think a bank will make much difference between five or seven or ten, okay. uh, quite honestly, mm -hmm. but um, maybe other people will disagree. I've got a question for Steve Tripp. <laughs> don't you hate those pesky car makers and the demands <laughs> they make on LSPs? <laughs> <laughs> They're extremely unreasonable. <laughs> What, what are you taking now in your, in your new job that you, know, that you think will help an LSP work better, more efficiently uh, because of your experience from the car maker and the other way around? I know it's new, uh, but what are you th even having been there just for a few months, what stuff have you learned that if you were, at the, if you were back at Chrysler or whatever, you think, I never thought of it that way, or maybe there's, there's something you know, that you've picked up in just a very short period of time, I know. Um, I, I would say, unfortunately, it is too new. I mean, we're, we've kind of got our hands full trying to get ready for a launch, and that's where all our attention is focused. But, mm -hmm. uh, um, but I would say that I think that the, uh, that the path that a lot of people are on, on collaboration uh, and sharing, is really absolutely the right direction. You know? And then there are more and more every day better platforms, better data sources around there. So I think that the, the, uh, the, the tone of this meeting is absolutely the right direction and, uh, and the direction everybody's taken is really, really the way to do it. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really encouraged. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Steve. I think I mentioned yesterday <coughs> we're, we're, um, we're putting together or we will be putting together our 10th anniversary issue uh, of finished vehicle logistics. 
Uh, I'm, of course, far too young to have been involved in, in the first one. <laughs> I think oh, I well, you were there. Uh, I, think I, <laughs> eight, I think it was eight months or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was an internship out of high school. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I've kind of been putting the question generally to look people to look kind of a bit back over that period and then a bit look forward in terms of you know, what, what the kind of big change might have been for them or their company um, over the last, uh, over, over roughly that period. But maybe the more important part to that question is, is what, what are some things that you might be anticipating uh, for the next 10? Or, or can you even? I mean, because that's obviously a big criticism that we often hear in this sector is it's a firefighting often more than a kind of forward-looking uh, fight. So if, if there's any either side of that question that you want to reflect on, I'd be interested to hear. <laughs> that's tough. <laughs> I, I, systems are just going to get better and better and better, uh, more sophisticated. Um, and I think there'll, there'll probably be efficiencies that we can't even think about today. Mm -hmm. But um, the basics of uh, production and accessorization and PDI, um, no, I think, it's, I, I think it's pretty much going to be the same as it was 10 years ago. Um, Ten years ago, actually, for us, there was more accessorization of a higher dollar value level. So the factory took a lot of items inside. The, in, inside and um, Since then? then since yeah, then, okay. yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I can't come up with anything. So, so Chris, I'm, I'm just curious, will, will self-driving cars deliver themselves? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's will we all be out of work? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think the I mean, lawyers. I don't think the lawyers. They should deliver themselves, right? You just tell them where to go, yeah, and the they show up on your doorstep after yeah. you buy it. Um, I don't think it is no. either. I really don't. No. The, and I've got kids yeah. coming up to driving age. I'm praying it starts before they start driving. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think. Um, but driverless yeah. trucks. Yeah. I mean, I just mm -hmm. saw somewhere they're at least chaining them together, right? Where the first one would have a driver. And the other ones would just kind of follow that truck. And that's, I think it's on the road somewhere now, right? Oh, wow. That's called the railroad. Yeah, but these are on time. And <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, guys, but we oh, gave you sorry, those. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> we gave you those rubber ships for a reason, so if you want to start throwing them now. <laughs> What's the insurance risk on that? <laughs> But no, there are there are trials uh, I think in yeah. Sweden and in and in Spain at the moment of exactly this mm. this sort of this sort yeah. of uh, procedure. And I'm speaking with BMW later this summer about their plans in the yard, so some yard management that cars using some obviously self parking and, and other kind of moves that they will look to um, mm. look to plan with some autonomous driving. Maybe not for this year, but they're they're looking they're, they're planning it. So I, I mean I think. It's certainly not that far out there, or not that wild to start thinking what this technology will mean, even for this for this industry, and and that hopefully it won't be doom and it doesn't need to be a doom and gloom, you know it, it could actually be quite a positive development as well. We have a question there. An FYI, yeah. an FYI, it's called platooning, uh, with one truck in the front and two trucks following behind it, yeah. and the driver in the front being able to control all three vehicles, and one company that has invested heavily in the technology is UPS, mm. just for your information. And they're not hooked, right? They're actually yeah. following right. one another, yeah. What happens you get stuck at the lights? The driver goes through and the other two get stuck behind them. <laughs> <laughs> just do what we do, just go through the lights. <laughs> Well, I used to be at McKinsey, so I don't mind offering a couple of predictions here. Mm -hmm. So if I think of 10 years from now, I expect a couple of things. Uh, Supplier-wise, a lot of consolidation. I think we've seen a lot happening in the last five, six years. But if you look at the, the industry, there's a couple of handfuls of OEMs, a couple of handfuls of banks, two main auction chains, and thousands of suppliers in the middle. And so. I expect there's going to be quite a bit of change in, in that. And for parts, that's already clearly been happening, right? The other thing I think, I, I, since I operate a lot in remarketing, I am very interested in what's happening in the dealer space. 
And a lot of what is happening today is really constrained by regulation. But if you think of certain new business models that are emerging, I, I think they're going to be mm -hmm. very slow moving, but very interesting. So if you look at places like Carvana, uh, very interesting, right? You buy a car online, they deliver it to your doorstep, it has a giant ro red bow on it. Um, you can drive it for three or four days, you don't like it, they'll go and take it back. And, uh, and that's how probably people will shop, maybe not five years from now, maybe not 10, but 20 or 30. I can see it. So I think that's going to complicate the supply chain because now instead of having to deal with 10,000, 20,000 dealers, you have to deal with 180 million people that want to buy their cars and you have to deliver at their doorstep. So if anything, all of this is going to be extremely more complex going in the future. My, well, we'll see 10 years from now and then we'll see whether, <laughs> whether it's happening or not, right? Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. Because we do events around the world, obviously, so we were in, just in China, what was a month and a half ago, and e-commerce, as you probably know, in China is, is sort of miles ahead of, of where, in terms of the penetration, there's, and people buy so much stuff online, and they're buying quite a lot of second-hand cars already, a lot, and it's starting to integrate into some, some new cars as well. So some, maybe some markets will be ahead of others in, in that way, too. Uh, I'd like to ask Bill, Bill Schroeder, what about the, the kind of mid-size... Uh, the mid-sized truck, trucking companies and what's happening f from your members and, and what do you pick up as, as a ha uh, for the, the current situation and their plans uh, for development? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say two-thirds of our members or more, not by number of units, but by number of companies are lower, fewer than 50 trucks. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, on one hand, it's a tremendous struggle for these people because they have to pay top dollar for every, everything they buy, and, um, and, and, and that, that's very difficult, and there's a lot of stress on them. But now, you know, I would debate that they're going to go away. Um, when I, we talk with these guys, in fact, one of the things we're doing with the whole idea of collaboration is trying to help these guys to be successful so that, because of the uh, EKG thing, so that people can use them and know that they have the right insurance and know that they have good CSA scores mm -hmm. and know that they're going to keep your KPIs where they need to be. And mm -hmm. I think as long as there's the uh, EKG, which is going to be for a long, long time, mm -hmm. these people are going to do well, especially since they do an awful lot of work in the secondary market. And it's almost like, and I'm, I'll be partially wrong here or maybe a lot wrong, it's almost like their backhaul is new cars, okay? You know, it's, it's a little bit the opposite of the larger carriers. Yeah. So, um, but you know, we talked before about collaboration. That's really what this little group is about. And we've been doing it, you know, with bits and spurts and fits and all that amongst ourselves. Mm -hmm. And um, now we're, we're feeling comfortable enough that we're going to start doing with some of the OEMs and eventually the rail and, um, and things like that. So, you know, the, the idea of, you know, what are your top three problems? What can we do to help solve them? First of all, identify them and then help solve them. Um, so I, I'm very, very optimistic about the, the future of the small tier, if you will, carriers. Um, you know, I think, you know, there's always the friction in an industry where you've got two or three or four that are huge, and then two or 3,000 that are small you know, in varying degrees. Mm -hmm. And there's always that friction saying, well, can't we do something to get rid of them? Because you know, we should be able to do that better than they can. And I don't see that happening for a long time. So does that answer your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to start over? <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks, Bill. <laughs> Any questions from the floor? Bob, any questions? No. <laughs> Actually, I did have one. Um, Microphone for the gentleman in the front. He makes me look good in the photo, so I've got to look after him. <laughs> and that's not easy. One of the discussions I had at, uh, at lunch uh, was concerning the uh, earlier panel on technology. And uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, you, you, the two of you could, you know, have a discussion on that in terms of what you feel 
the challenges are for ins uh, for instance in implementing uh, you know some of the systems that you've developed lately if you have any uh, you know I know this kind of a broad question but implementation the easy bit of technology Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> Mike? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, for us, uh, you know, almost all the systems we've had uh, that we've uh, launched recently, we've developed in-house. We're not buying a lot off the shelf. Uh, even simple things like uh, purchase systems and travel request systems. And, and uh, you know, it, it's, uh, we have a sister company that does all the programming and it's, they've actually been launched uh, fairly smooth. Uh, the one area that um, we keep trying to use technology and just hasn't worked for us is uh, locating vehicles in a parking lot. So we've gone from RFID tags, which weren't worth, you know, weren't worth buying. We didn't do what we thought they would, but they looked nice. It was a good sales <laughs> thing, but uh, did they really work? Not like I thought they would. We've talked about GPS tracking devices for the yards. And uh, you know, right now we're still just using the old technology of you know, this vehicle is in this bay and you know, we'll be uh, scanning a barcode to put it in so you avoid any type of type, you know, type, uh, typos. But uh, high tech ways, we haven't figured out how to do it yet. So uh, latest is I heard that the GPS is getting accurate enough so that we can actually use that. But well, last time we looked at GPS, it's within you know, five yards. And we need to know exactly where the car is because when you send a guy out at night and he's gonna go to a spot to pick that car, if it's within one or three, you know, <laughs> you know it could be six spaces around them, you know, so uh, it has to be perfect. The, the IT people that support my team are, are really quasi-members of my team. Um, almost, at least half of the meetings we have the IT people are right in there with us. So they, under, they understand what we're trying to do. Um, they, they always have concerns about the timelines and the budgets, but um, I, I think there's, there is a very good collaboration between uh, those folks and, and, and my group. And there's a, um, you know, it's all, implement, implementation is always something that's going to go wrong. And you just have to get yes, you have to get over it as quickly as, as quickly as possible. You try to test as much as you can, um, so that when you do when you do try to implement that you you know you're ready to go. But there's there's always some glitch out there, and the the, the, the real challenge is to get over the glitch as, as quickly as possible and get on with it. Uh, just to feed into that last, you know, uh, answer. Do you have? Uh, uh, or do you see any way to uh, cut the paperwork uh, or cut some of the inefficiencies that you see in your processes, um, you know, that we mentioned earlier, like, you know, going from one department to another uh, five times to, with duplicate paperwork? I'm all about paperwork. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Any, anybody who's seen my office um, uh, knows that... Uh, I, I have the greatest accumulation of paper that, that one office can possibly have. So, so much so that the HR department, when, when someone is feeling a little down and the, the wellness program kicks in, they'll, they'll bring them up to my office and within five seconds, they feel better about themselves. <laughs> you should be more high tech like me. I've got in front of me just for one session, I've got an iPad, uh, iPhone 6, the biggest one, a mini iPad small paper cards, uh, and a big book to write my notes on as well. And the value of that, of course, is that when I'm actually looking for the question, I can't find it. <laughs> well, we've announced that we're moving our headquarters, so I've got a clock ticking on when I'm going to have to clean up. So I'll be high tech by then. <laughs> Are you another one moving to Texas then? <laughs> um, no, we're moving to Camden, New Jersey. Yeah, and once Mercedes saw that, they, they chose Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Camden? Mm -hmm. Camden, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, now that you took the good spot, yeah. That's yeah. Probably good. yeah. yeah. Any, uh, any uh, maybe last questions? We're getting probably near the end of this session. Nope. 
the very last point? No, I guess uh, one of the things, we, we had a, um, I don't, it wasn't even a survey, I sent a question out to some of the, the car makers, the heads of logistics at, at various car makers around the world, with just a, one question. What is the biggest waste, the single biggest waste in automotive logistics? I'd like to throw that to you two guys and, and anyone in the audience. What is the single biggest waste in vehicle logistics? And perhaps, you know, if possible, secondary, you know, and what can we do about it? But at least if we can identify uh, what, what's the biggest waste. I was surprised at the answer I got. Bearing in mind, I wrote to the heads of global logistics at global car makers at the simplicity of the answers, uh, of the question rather, not the answers, otherwise it wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be an issue. So what is the single biggest waste in, in vehicle logistics? Wow. I mean, I'd like to think I've got one of the biggest wastes in finished vehicle logistics, but that's, <laughs> that's not what I meant. <laughs> pro pro probably on the import side it is the uh, variability of the, of the vessel arrivals and the, and the size of the boats. Mm -hmm. So uh, some, as much as we try to, to smooth out the work, um, so we're processing every day of, of the month, um, we'll be out of work two or three days on occasion. Mm -hmm. And we may have back-to-back -back boats arriving two, or two, two days apart. And we have that a lot. Um, you know, if we could, um, if we could find a way to, to even the even the flow a little bit more on that side, uh, I think that would be beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. Because we're we're tying up a lot of, of space at the ports. Um, we do we do probably more accessorization than most brands. So. Um, I know some people don't do any accessorization and they try to load rail cars uh, over a two or three day period and get, get it gone, but uh, <coughs> our, our cars do, do dwell while we're working on them. Glenn? Hmm. Uh, I mean, that's a tough one. Um, well, has anyone else got anything to add while Glenn's <laughs> empty? What is that? Which one? Well, quick. So should we wait for the microphone if any of our guys? We'll get this one first, seeing as he started. Seeing as he rudely pushed into the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> These Americans. It's almost, it's almost tongue in cheek, but answering RFQs when the OE or the issue of the RFQ has no intention of making a change. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. They're just Good testing point. the market, you mean? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I don't think we, we could be accused of doing that, but. Um, uh -huh. Let's I, I go think back to Scott and back and then we'll It's probably just an internal yeah. policy, mm -hmm. maybe. That's yeah, what happens um, when you put purchasing departments in charge of logistics. <laughs> I hope I'm not offending anybody. Gavin, but Gavin. That, Sorry. Every time I see a company do that, I'm like, oh no. Vehicle holds. Mm. Holds placed by the factory on vehicles. Okay. Because it just adds up. It's an additive process because once they go off site, getting them from the off-site, paying for them off-site, moving them uh, with uh, off-standard methods, that's got to be the most costly thing that there is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Scott. Yeah. Um, no one else, just Scott. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that uh, truck utilization, and I expand on the truck utilization idea, that the truck is only running eight to ten hours per day. Uh, we're at night, certainly it goes back to the night deliveries and the 24-7. I know, Gerald, you're, you, you guys have got a great initiative going on with that. I think that is the biggest waste that I see because we can put a driver in that truck in, you know, in the second uh, phase in the next 12 hours and we can utilize that truck. So we're only getting 50% utilization of the truck on a day-to-day -day basis. And then, of course, weekends too. Oh, I, I have one. Yeah. Um, I talked to somebody about this earlier today, but... Um, I've been thinking, I know that some people are starting to think about this, we're actually doing it, I heard Mercedes is one of them, but I, they call it the concierge service, but we have a driver shortage. So why are we wasting our driver's time walking around yards in, in, you know, in one of our factory cases, I think our, you know, Don probably knows, but our truckway area is probably 15, 20 acres. And this, you know, I look out the window, I watch these guys in the 100 and something degree weather walking around cars, getting his nine cars to shuttle them up to the truck, then he's got to load his truck, then he's got to go, of course. But, I mean, if, if we had a way that we can 
have the trucker send us, hey, these nine cars are a load. My truck's going to be in there at 2 o'clock this afternoon. We have a crew go out there, you know, temp labor, 10, well, 15 bucks an hour now. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, you have a temp uh, labor, go out there and bring these cars up, stage them in a row for them. We send a file back so the driver, when he pulls in our yard, he knows that he's got to pull up to bay, you know, H. And he pulls up there and his cars are right there. And, uh, and then by that time, we've already had a chance to inspect them one last time, make sure there's no damage. He'll probably have to inspect it again anyway. But at least that way he's not spending an hour walking around the yard looking for his cars and getting tired. And uh, even if he's coming a little bit without a lot of notice, while he's loading one, we could be pulling the other ones up for him. So I think, you know, and, um, and the other thing I was thinking is, um, and I, it, you know, I, I know, I don't think any of our, uh, the, the trucking companies are higher volume do this, but those, the, the trucks that have uh, not the rack on, on the unit, but just the, the one that pulls behind, you know, what if we had a fleet of those that as a manufacturer, we actually load that thing up and, and then a truck comes in, just pulls it out, and unloads it. Because unloading, I think, is easier than loading a truck, if I'm not mistaken. So you have a driver that comes in, backs up to that trailer, pulls it out of there minutes later, goes and delivers it, comes back, drops the empty off, picks up a full one, and goes and delivers that one. I mean, would that work? Because, I mean, what, where, we, where, where we keep getting ourselves uh, in a jam is these, these, these peaks. We talked about the EKG. but. We get in that peak, you know, when we release fleet or whatever we're doing, and all of a sudden our customer wants us to have, you know, 500 extra trucks for the weekend. We don't have them. But if we had some, and these trucks, I believe, are less expensive than the full rigs with the racks. And I think those types of drivers are not as hard to come by either, right? Because at least he's not having to load the thing. He's just unloading. And we can use less expensive labor to load the truck. Plus, he's not going to have the hours issue because he didn't spend all that time loading a truck. I mean, does anybody think that might have any merit to look into or no? Or is that? Uh, Dave with Tesla, we actually, we actually looked into that drop and hook model yeah. kind of briefly and uh, it, was, it was just capital intensive, but I, th I think it is a great idea and you also need some sort of a power source for the hydraulics on some that. Of, yeah, some of them yeah. are self-contained, right? And some of them you have to have the rig hooked up, right? But I mean, in our yard, we'd have those yeah. little tractors, you know, those little tiny ones that uh, have those around just to move trailers around, right? Or you know, have the ones that have their own self-contained unit. They're probably more expensive to buy, though, right? Yeah, but yeah, it's a great idea. It's something we're, we kind of have on the back burner still. Yeah, yeah. And if I think if everyone else did the same thing, it would also help a lot too with backhauls. And yeah, I mean, even I mean, we, we have the space to store them too. So I mean, at our facility, we could store them. Because I'm th I'm thinking this would be for a peak issue. But I wonder mm -hmm. if a driver that drives that type of truck could be could be and would be willing to unload it. You know, I don't know if they would damage them or... We'd still need the, the particular training to be able to do that safely, right? We've looked at different configurations uh, along the lines of what you're talking about. One of the challenges that would need to be overcome is, is the empty backhaul um, because that, you know, it it's, uh, creates an issue on the way back, the uniformity of equipment, et cetera. But, but there are probably <laughs> ramp applications where you could look at that. A, a, an additional challenge, uh, not to be a wet blanket, but an additional challenge to consider is the lengthening haul that we're seeing today, particularly as um, you know more is coming off rail going into uh, going onto trucks. So you've got a, you've got longer distances too um, that that are complicating that. But it's it's something we're looking at actually, Glenn. Okay. Anyone else have any experience with? I think Just all the way over here on the left here, there's a gentleman that has. Yeah. Well, we'll start there. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's right. We'll just go with Andrew and then we'll move across. Yeah. Well, I love where this conversation is going. And by the way, I'm sure that if we all were to sit down here in an hour and throw ideas, there's a lot. I mean, to, to your question, there's probably a hundred answers that we can find in an hour, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll give you my succinct answer to what's the biggest waste. I, I think it's the difficulty in getting a pilot going with the risk knowing that something is going to fail. And for instance, what we see a lot more in the remarketing arena as opposed to the new car side is this, this, this risk willingness of trying stuff. And there's a lot of millionaires out there with a 0.3 button average. 
And not everything needs to succeed. What doesn't work, you can kill it very quickly and you move on to the next item on the list. But uh, again, today we were talking about collaboration and all these kind of things. And we're all economic animals. We will collaborate fiercely when there's an economic incentive. And so all it takes is to work with our competitors, with our people that are before and after in the supply chain, with our customers, and come up with what are those ideas where everybody can have a win, try them, and then if they work, let's do it. And we do it regularly a lot more probably in the remarketing arena than not, but that's why we have you know, our CIO here, because we believe in technology, we believe in innovation. You heard it from Sarah. This is what we hope we have a lot more of these kind of communications um, going on in this room. Thank you. Question down there. Come on, hurry up. Gavin, you were fast enough when you were trying to get the s'mores yesterday. <laughs> Joe Mayuri with United Road. Uh, biggest waste that I see in the industry is yard management at both plant sites, rail sites, and ports. Uh, drivers not being able to find vehicles, the loading time that it takes, uh, getting dealers, uh, let's say a ship comes in and you've got six units going to a remote dealer that's way out in the distance and three of them get released the first day and you know three or four more are still sitting there for that same dealer and if you yet dispatch <laughs> that truck and send it on its way, uh, it's not very efficient. So uh, that's really a big thing. Also, Glenn, your idea about uh, switching out trailers is a good one. However, uh, that only generally will work probably up to 100 miles. Once you start getting a longer distance, much more difficult to, uh, to do. But it is a great idea for short hauls, and, and that's a big part of the business. All right, thanks. We, we don't have concierge service, but when our truck away motor pool exceeds uh, uh, the normal amount and goes into overflow, we pay the processor to run a shuttle van for the drivers to get out, out to that area. Any more suggestions for the biggest waste? <coughs> okay. There may be a, we can start wrapping up, uh, wrapping up really. Uh, before, we, before we start doing that, you've got evaluation forms in front of you or on your chairs. They really are very important to us. We take them very seriously. We read every single one and try and act on, on every suggestion where possible. So please complete them. We do really take them seriously. As an incentive, uh, we're giving away a, a box of the Queen's favourite biscuits, which is good news. The bad news is if you read the London Times tomorrow, you'll find out the Queen's been looking for her biscuits because someone stole them. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and if you see any corgi bites on them and things like that. So, um, so uh, just to kind of, uh, so please complete the forms. Once you've completed them, raise your hands. We'll collect them and put them in, uh, put them in for the draw. Uh, just really, to, you know, I hope you had a good couple of days. I hope you enjoyed the content. I hope that, you know, as opposed to previous years, that we've matured and grown up. So when I say to you, what do you remember about the Finnish Vehicle Logistics Conferences, you won't just say, do you remember when those girls dropped their pants on the boat? and stuff like that, and that we're now going to remember the content and some of the questions and conversations we've had. Um, I think that, you know, I was encouraged by the openness of the discussions, the willingness to, to participate, to ask questions where possible. You know, we love the buzz at the lunches and the coffee breaks and the cocktail receptions uh, to see that conversation and, and the networking going on. One of the, we, we do conferences all around the world, including a few in North America, which, in, which bring everybody together, inbound, outbound, after sales, and so on. But the value that people say they get from the Finnish Vehicle Logistics Conference is you could almost sit next to anybody at, at, at lunch or, or speak to anybody during the coffee break, and they will have some value to you. They might be a competitor, but you can still talk to each other and pick up some information. Uh, there could be a future customer, partner. Uh, that's also the downside because you have to be careful what you say at these events because you never know next year the guy you were sitting next to or the person you were sitting next to at lunch next year could be your boss, your customer, your partner, your supplier. Uh, it's that kind of industry. But I hope you've enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the, the two days. I'd like to thank our, our sponsors, Jack Cooper, who are the premier sponsor and the host of that fantastic dinner last night. Our gold sponsors, ICL, JMN, 
uh, KHS, Metrogistics, Montway and Voith, our global sponsors CTM and Wallanius Wilhelmsen Logistics, and our silver sponsors BNSF, Car Delivery Network, Crown Auto Transport, Hyundai Glovis, GoTo, Inform, Insight Network Logistics, Nationwide Auto Services, United Road, US Auto Logistics and Vascor. They sponsor the conferences not just to pay for my kids' education, but because they offer services, products, knowledge for your industry, for finished vehicle logistics. So please, you know, it's the end of the conference now, but visit their websites and, and find out what perhaps you could have, you could have got them from them. Uh, and I hope you, you know, uh, you know, see the value that they can offer. Um, I'd also, uh, as we're you know, getting closer to wrapping up, I think you know, the last panel discussion, which you know, ended up with two people, uh, but I think was a great discussion, got some great points made at the end of the conference. I read a quote at the beginning of the, well, maybe I should just finish off by thanking the panel initially anyway. So thanks to the panel, to Glenn and Gerald. At the cocktail reception, uh, what seemed like three weeks ago, uh, I, was, I quoted Peter Drucker, where he said, you know, some of the greatest discussions are had at cocktails or over cocktails, but then they never get done because you forget about it when you leave. So let's hope that this conference isn't like that. We do have great conversations every year, great discussions, you know, great intentions. Uh, and then you get back to your office tomorrow or Monday and you're overwhelmed by the thunderstorm or the snow or the earthquake or whatever it is, or the late delivery and something. And then all the great intentions we've had over the last couple of days just get forgotten. Try not to forget them. You know, we've got three, over 300, 350 people of the most important people in Finnish vehicle logistics in North America in this room, networking and sharing ideas. It'd be such a waste if it just gets forgotten when you go back to your offices. So um, are we ready for the prize draw? Normally on TV shows, you normally ask a beautiful assistant to come and help you. <laughs> but I would, like to, I would like to thank Nimish Ladwell. Nimish Ladwell led the program and the content for this conference on our behalf. Uh, and I think he did a great job. And because of that, he's probably going to get fired on Monday. <laughs> but thank you very much, Nimish. I really appreciate it. And hopefully they're in the room. Brian Moran from Sun Country Trailers, is he still around? Oh, you gotta be present to win, right? Yeah, you gotta you gotta be in it to win it. So I don't know if he's still around. <laughs> the Queen snoozed and she lost her biscuits, so so did Brian Moran. <laughs> oh yeah, there's no point in putting it back. I'll only draw it out again when I <laughs> Well, if he's here, I'm going to be very annoyed because he should have been on stage. <laughs> he's Ch Chuck Kending, I guess, has left. <laughs> he's definitely not getting the biscuit. <laughs> if you do, anyone who's here, just put your hand up and get, tell me who your name is. Alejandro from, uh, from Terminal Zarate in Argentina. Has he left early to, to go back to Argentina? Just left. <laughs> <laughs> everybody, everybody just left. <laughs> Obviously running a little late. <laughs> it's an attrition game. Andy Salins from CM Shipping. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have had a jar of the people. Yeah. Let's hope you're lucky. Let's open them up, everyone, to share. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That's, a, that's real collaboration. Yeah. <laughs> Now, this guy deserves the biscuits. because He's given us great information, great feedback, and never put his name on the form. Next one. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Kassam is from Mercedes. He's gone. <laughs> I've got a feeling I might make this really simple. I don't know whether to go for this. This has got two names on it. One name is Sarah Ryan from WWL. Is Sarah around? 
Okay, the other name that says on it is Bill Garrett from Vascor. He's won the bloody biscuits. (laughs) 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 And... (laughs) Well done, Bill. (laughs) 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 So, uh, lesson number one, no one likes the Queen's biscuits. (laughs) But... uh, uh, thank you very much. Our next uh, North American, well, our next event is in Moscow. I'm not sure how many of you are going to be travelling over for that one. I know Bill is, Bill Pollock. There's backhaul problems everywhere around the world, Bill, aren't there? So um, uh, after that is Import Export North America in Baltimore. And then after that is Automotive Logistics Global in Detroit in September. So hopefully we'll see all of you at one or both of those events. It would be great to see you there. Um, by then, hopefully, we'll have a number of member of the Finnish Vehicle Logistics team, uh, Baby Allard. So as we're, you know, as we're live on the, uh, on the live stream now, and it's probably about 5 o'clock in the morning out for him, uh, well, it's, I'm, I guess he's going to have to get used to being awake at late nights and <laughs> stuff very soon. So I'd like, just like to wish uh, Michelle and, and Matt the best of luck with the impending birth. I'm sure all of us in the room send them, the, send us, send them the, our best wishes and uh, we'll make sure you, you hear the news uh, as soon as, as we know something. So we hope they have a, a happy and, uh, and, and healthy child to announce on over the weekend. But thank you very much for your participation. I hope you've enjoyed the event. Um, we look forward to seeing you back in California just to be on the safe side, but probably Newport Beach uh, in 2016. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much.